Welcome to the lecture on the computational structure of life cycle assessment. This lecture is taken from the class Life Cycle Management that I teach every year at the University of Freiburg, together with my colleague Rainer Grieshammer from Öko Institut. This lecture is the central method lecture of the entire class. And the reason is that we want to cast in this lecture the entire modeling of life cycle assessment into a single mathematical equation. Everything that is covered by life cycle assessment, the service provided by functional units, the industrial systems that provides those services and products, the emissions and resources, so the interaction with the environment, and the environmental mechanisms and their damage back to people, all this will be cast into a single mathematical equation. And how this is done is the topic of this lecture. We start out with the basic inventorying of industrial processes. We take an industrial process here that's uh, symbolized by this blue block box on primary steel production by a certain company in Germany. And this box has inputs from other industrial processes. These are called precursor products. Here it's coke and electricity. The other inputs are natural resources that are taken from the natural environment. And then there's products, main products and byproducts that go to other industries. And there's emissions and waste that go to nature. We take a single process and we inventory the different inflows and outflows according to these four groups. And when we do that, we can also take the same inventory and normalize it. Normalize means we take an inventory that we actually measured and convert it to a reference unit, maybe one ton of steel or one kilowatt hour of electricity. There is no factory on this planet that only makes one ton of steel, but we take an existing factory that maybe makes two megatons of steel and we scale it down. So we assume a linear process model. This is a basic assumption of conventional life cycle assessment. We can then take a process inventory and put it into vector form. A vector here is just a column of numbers and this column has three compartments. The first compartment is shown as green on the right side. It's the resource uptake. Then we have a gray compartment, it's the products uptake, and then we have the emissions back to the environment. You may ask where is now the flow of outputs here, and the flow of output is the reference unit of the whole column. So you can see it's the column label says steel production, one ton of steel. So everything that goes in here and the emissions that go out are normalized according to the main product. You can also use that scheme to record byproducts they would be typically inventoried as a negative product input. With that background, we now want to conceptualize the entire system that we want to cover. What you see here, these two ellipses, are what I call the notion of the socio-ecological system. We have society, that is the social sphere of causation, where we have relationship between people, we have public and political institutions, and we have social things like monetary values, for example, or ownership relations. At the same time, we have the biophysical sphere of causation. This is everything that adheres to the laws of physics. And we can further subdivide the intersection of the two, so everything that's socially perceived and that has a natural component, a biophysical component, we can divide this intersection of the two spheres into something that is controlled by society, that society is biophysical basis, and the natural environment. And now we can take the different elements of life cycle assessment and put it into that scheme. We will start here on the right side by describing society as consumers. Consumers are people, households or institutions that have a demand for a certain service, maybe transportation or electricity, heating fuels or other needs that people have. These services are typically provided by the goods we have in our households, if we think of ourselves as consumers. So maybe the washing machine or the fridge in our household would provide the service that we need of cooling, of getting the laundry done, or maybe of just having a cozy place to chill out on a Sunday evening. These households are delivered by markets. The markets are processes that distribute products between industries and from industries to consumers. 
The markets are supplied by industries with products that they can distribute then to other industries or households. The industries need other industrial products that they buy on the markets and they need resources from the natural environment and they emit to the natural environment. The natural environment then has certain mechanisms. Most famous one is maybe climate change where we have a certain driver that's our CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions and then we have a certain response of the system, the natural environment system to these emissions which is then global warming and changing weather patterns. So we can also have a causality back from the environmental mechanisms back to society and this is what we call impact or damage factors. What we want to do now is we want to take all the flows that are given here between those processes and we want to start quantifying them, introducing symbols to them and then building a mathematical model with the ultimate purpose to link the impact of the natural environment back to society all the way to our own consumption activities. This is the goal of this lecture. Before we start, a short recap on the basic LCA concepts and definitions. When I say functional unit, I mean a quantitative description of a certain service by an industrial output to the end user. Service could, for example, be a thousand kilometer drive with an electric passenger vehicle in a standard driving cycle. We also have the reference flow. The reference flow indicates the amount of industrial products that is needed to deliver the service. For example, to drive a thousand kilometers with an electric vehicles, I need electricity, roughly 200 kilowatt hours, but I also need the vehicle. It's typical of life cycle assessment that you don't allocate a full vehicle to your small unit of driving, but you break it down according to the total kilometrage of the vehicle over its lifetime. So when you want to drive a thousand kilometers, but the vehicle lasts 200,000, you would take 0.005 electric vehicles. So this is the translations from the functional unit to the reference flow. We then have to construct the product system. The product system is not a real system. The product system is a constructed entity that is a sub system or a fraction of the actual industry, the actual economy that delivers the reference flow. If your reference flow is one ton of steel, you need to take the ind actual industrial system and break it down so that the final output then will only be one ton of steel. So you can see it is a constructed entity because there is no industry that only produces one ton of steel. So we need to take actual industries and somehow scale them. And how we do this, we will see in a minute. We then have the life cycle inventory. The life cycle inventory denotes all the flows between the product system and environment and also within the product system. And then we have the emissions and resources and these are the flows that cross the boundary between the product system, which is part of the industry, and the natural environment. So now we will start doing the math. And we need to understand that all the flows we have here need to be categorized. For example, the objects that we talk here, we talk about here, the services and the products and the emissions, they will enter or they will be used in the mathematical equations as labels. For example, we had our column vector describing an industrial process and this process has column labels that tell you what is flowing in there. So these would be commodity labels or product labels and emissions and resource labels. So we have three types of objects in the socio-economic metabolism or societies by the physical basis, which is the services, the products and emissions and resources. We have four types of process groups that you can see depicted in the major scheme. It's society, represented by agents, you have households, markets and industries. The functional unit that we defined earlier can be written as a column vector. The column vector contains the number of services as different row labels times one certain column. An example is given here. I, you can pause the lecture and read it silently and the final demand, sorry, the functional unit vector F is the one that leaves the households or that is provided by the goods and services in the households to the agents and society, to us. The service intensity is a conversion factor that converts mathematically 
the different services into reference fields. So the transformation of a thousand kilometers electric vehicle drivings into actual gasoline demand, uh, sorry, of course, electricity demand and vehicle use can be done by a matrix multiplication. The matrix S converts services that are provided by our products that we consume into the commodities that we need to buy to get those services. So S has the dimensions commodity times services. And if we multiply S with F, we get the reference flow Y that is also called the final demand. An example is given here. And now we will try to model the product system, which is the part of the industry that delivers the reference flow. I want to do this a bit briefly because this is already standard process in LCA textbooks to teach exactly this part. The easiest way of getting the product system is to model it by hand. You take the process that is closest to your reference flow and you just start walking up the supply chain. If your reference flow includes steel, you take the steel making process and look what do I need? I need coke and electricity. So you link your steel industry to the coking plant and to a power station. For the power station you may need coal or you may need steel for the wind turbines so you can link it back to the steel industry or you link it to a coal mine and so on. So you can draw the different linkages in the system which are the products that flow from one production step to the next to finally be converted into your reference flow and you can quantify those flows according to the process models that we use in LCA. This is very intuitive but it's quite laborsome when you think that many industries need maybe 10 or 20 different major inputs that all should be considered. So this will be a lot of work. And the other problem is that many products appear again and again. For example, to make coal, you need electricity. To make electricity, you maybe need more coal. So you have a kind of loop there that of course gets smaller and smaller, but it's quite tedious to quantify. So there's good reasons for and good reasons against for modeling the product system by hand. And here we will, of course, not model the product system by hand because we want to develop a general mathematical model. So I'll pause for a moment so that you can read those advantages and disadvantages, and then I'll move on with a mathematical model. The solution is here that we cast the entire product system as a matrix. Before, I explained that the individual process can be modeled as a column vector. One column vector represents one industry. What I can now do is I can stack the different process descriptions in form of column vectors into a table or a matrix. And an example you see here, we have a table with three compartments. We have a resource use matrix that is the green fraction, tells you the different resources, the rows, used by the different industries, the columns. The same with products, the same with emissions. And to make this whole system work, the um, unit of reference for the columns must also be the unit of the commodity. So you see, for example, that the steel production is normalized for a ton of steel, and also the row label steel is given in tons. Same with electricity, the same with coke. For the LCA process mathematical model to work, you need to make sure that your number of products equals your number of industries. So this gives you the gray matrix here, the inter-industry usage A. It's also called the matrix of technical coefficients. You need to make sure the number is the same, so the matrix is square. You need to make sure that the numbers, sorry, that the products and the industries come in the same order. So if your industry says steel making, electricity generation, coke production, your product order should be steel, electricity, coke. And you need to have the same units. So if your steel process has a reference unit tons, the steel product must also be in tons. When you respect those constraints, you get a consistent system description 
in form of your stacked industry descriptions and we can move on with the modeling. A few more comments here, you can read this. We will now move on with a mathematical model and you can see the black symbols in the figure it's s y and f so the reference flow the functional unit and the service intensity they already have been quantified and now we introduce two new quantities the first one is the total industrial output x x is the flow between industries and markets and the second flow is the flow from markets back to industries so this is what we call inter-industry flows or intermediate consumption and it can be mathematically obtained as a times x hat where a is the square matrix of technical coefficients so the per unit product requirements of the different industries that we just defined times the actual output vector x on the diagonal so when you do such a mathematical operation you just scale the different columns of A by the respective industrial output X. And the matrix A times X hat, so A times X diagonal, is the matrix of inter-industry flows or a bit more precisely commodity to industry flows because industries don't consume other industries, they consume the products of other industries. So this is commonly noted as the Z matrix because here we're using the notion of the Leontief input output model. With this extract from the system definition, so the total output x, a times x hat as inter industry flows, we can start constructing the supply chain step by step. Think that you need a unit of electricity, that's your final demand. The first thing that will happen is that the industry delivers you that unit of electricity and in the second step the industry will need precursor products that are defined or determined by a times y a matrix of technical coefficients matrix multiplied by y these intermediate products also need to be produced so the second order output x1 is exactly a times y to produce this one in turn you need a times a times y products a square y which are also delivered by the industry and so on so you can construct by going up the supply chain step by step different powers of a multiplied by the final output y the reference flow that represent the different stages of the supply chain and if that power series of unit matrix plus a plus a square and so on converges it can be rewritten as follows the sum of all these powers is the same as 1 minus a inverse and l is called the Leontief inverse this is a mathematical operation it is if you want to say the generalization of the geometric series to matrix algebra it works if the series above converges and it does converge converge because our industrial system is finite and the model here is just a description of the industrial system so if your database is constructed correctly and you don't make unit mistakes this will always converge there is a more technical notion of deriving the Leontief in private model so the one we just talked about is the notion the the derivation from a power series. Here we use the market balance instead. The first equation in boxes x is z times e plus y is the market balance. What does it mean? e in this notion is a vector, a column vector with only ones. It's a summation vector. If you multiply z with e from the right it's just a fancy way of writing down the row sum of z. You sum up over all products irrespective of the industry where they are consumed and the market balance says everything that is produced everything that's in x must be either consumed by other industries and that's z times e or it must be consumed by final consumers finally moment so x is z times e plus y means everything that's produced is either consumed by other industries 
or by final demand sectors. I can now rewrite z as a times x hat, as we introduced it before, and I can use the law of association that allows me to switch the brackets, so that is doesn't change the result, that's a property of matrix equations. And then I get the market balance in terms of x, y, and a. x is a times x plus y. Very simple. And I can resolve this equation for x, and this is the famous Leontief model equation, x is l times y, where l is 1 minus a inverse, of course, provided that this inverse exists. A very important feature of the L and the A matrix is that it can handle different units. If your steel happens to be in tons, and your services in euros, and your energy in terajoule, you get a mess of units in your A matrix. Maybe I shouldn't say mess, because it's all structured, but you definitely get a lot of them. And you can make this calculation by yourself. If you take an A matrix that has different units, like the one that is shown here, and you multiply it by itself, the resulting power, a square, will have exactly the same units. And the same for a cube, a to the 4, and so on. And also the L matrix will have the same units. And this is of course related to the meaning of those coefficients. It means that there is a certain demand in kilogram of material per unit per euros of service produced, and so on. And this will stay the same, this, this linkage, for different orders of the supply chain. It is also important to remember that in a system that has mixed units, like euros, kilograms, and terajoule, you can always calculate the market balance. You have to record electricity in terajoule all across the system. Only then the market balance works. And the market balance is the Leontief model equation, so this has to have the same units. What doesn't work in a mixed unit system is the industry balance. So for example, you cannot compute the row sum sorry, the column sum of the z-matrix in such a system, because these flows all have different units. That's also important to remember. We will now take the next step, and this is to include emissions. Emissions can be calculated by the matrix of relative emissions, it's called B in this case here, times the industrial output x. So when B tells you how much CO2 is emitted per ton of steel produced in the steel industry, and X tells you how many tons of steel were produced to build your reference flow, then B times X is the emissions from that process. Again, it works with matrix multiplication. So we calculate the total emissions vector B as the emissions intensity matrix B, capital B, times the output vector X. So this is now how far we've come. We start from the right here, we have a reference flow, we multiply it from the left with 1 minus A inverse, that constructs the entire product system, the entire supply chain, to get the total output X, and then we multiply X, which is 1 minus A inverse Y, with the emissions coefficients to get the emissions of the product system. For a very simple system, it would look like this, just written out the life cycle inventory stage of life cycle assessment in one line. Also, if you want to have a different source that explains this type of math, please have a look at chapter 8 of the LCA textbook that's linked here on this slide. This is really a good reference from our colleagues from the US that you can also use to better understand the mathematical modeling here. We want to move on and we want now include the environmental mechanisms. We just had an equation that transfers the reference flow y into emissions and resources. And now the next obvious step is to link emissions and resources to environmental impacts and to environmental damage. For linking emissions and resources to environmental impacts and damages, we need to introduce more objects and process groups. The objects that we consider here are the emissions and resources, it's the environmental midpoints and the environmental endpoints. And the process groups that are dealt with are the environmental mechanisms of type 1, 
and the ones of type 2. So type 1s are those that link emissions to midpoints and type 2 are those that link emissions midpoints then to endpoints. This part of the equation is modeled after the structure of recipe, one of the most widely used impact assessment methods. And the division of the translation of emissions into endpoints is done in two steps. And the reason is that for some environmental mechanisms we have rather high certainty, for example global warming, but we don't know exactly how the global warming will translate into damages. So the idea is to split the impact chain, the causal chain from emissions to damages into a part that's scientifically safe or established and a part where we don't have enough data or where the modeling is just too complex so that we can only give a rough indication. The list of midpoints covered by recipe is quite comprehensive. So in this diagram you see the emissions that are the LCI results, the result of the life cycle inventory, the emissions of the product system on the left side, and they are then linked to the different environmental midpoints or environmental mechanisms. Of course, the different greenhouse gases are linked to climate change, to different ozone depleting substances, to ozone depletion, and for each of them we have a certain midpoint indicator. <coughs> Those indicators are then linked to the endpoint mechanisms and then we have three final endpoints. So that's the human health in disability adjusted life years daily. We have the ecosystems measured in species and we have the resources. We want to express the coupling between emissions and environmental midpoints by factors. Coupling factors that we call characterization factors. These characterization factors are by physical quantities that indicates how a certain resource or emission impacts a certain environmental mechanism. So in the notion of the system, the environmental mechanisms and the characterization factors are quantified by a matrix of characterization factors that has the dimension number of mechanisms times number of emissions. With this matrix we can translate the emissions vector B that we calculated previously into environmental midpoint indicators C by a simple matrix equation C small case lowercase c is capital case times C times B. We can do the same with a matrix of damage factors that has a dimension endpoints times midpoints that then translates the environmental midpoint indicator C into endpoints or damage factors H. The whole equation looks like that. We have the final demand or the reference flow on the right side. We translate it into the product system using 1 minus A inverse. We apply emissions, characterization factors to then get the total environmental midpoints. And with the variables now introduced and the definitions made, we can now write the entire life cycle assessment computations into a single model equation. We have the damage caused by a certain service flow or reference flow as a combination of the product system modeled by 1 minus A inverse, the emissions coefficients of the industries, the characterization factors that couple emissions to midpoints, and the characterization factors of the endpoints that couple midpoints to endpoints. In the overall picture, the equation looked like that. <clears throat> we go from the functional unit all the way up to the damage factors. And you can see what elements we need. It is four matrices, A to D, that model the different parts of the system, and we need the service conversion matrix S. I also would like to stress that the explanations here do not replace the um, 
dealing with those different factors in detail. Here, the purpose was just to give the broad overview of the computational structure and not of the actual content or the actual science, for example, behind the characterization factors C and the damage factors D. To finalize, I would like to stress that the mathematical approach taken here is based on the Leontief input-output model. There is a similar approach that was published in a book called Computational Structure of Lifecycle Assessment by Hayungs and Su in 2002. There the authors also take a matrix approach and apply a linear production function to arrive at a similar equation. But it's important to know that these approaches, even though they have the same assumptions, differ in practice. They differ in terms of their modeling. For example, the A matrix and Leontief is always coefficients, is it input per unit of output, whereas Hyux and Su also use an A matrix, but this A matrix is at scale. And also the Leontief inventory is based on the balance inventory, balanced inventory of the entire industrial system, whereas in the Hyungs and Su approach you can take different and also disconnected process inventories and put them into the same model. If you're interested in learning more about the differences and the similarities between those two approaches, please have a look at exercise 10 in this chapter, and there some additional explanations are given. It's important to understand that both approaches are equivalent, but it's also important to know that they use different notation, sorry, they use the same notation but with different meaning, and they also work differently in practice. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention.